Greetings and welcome to 303 and uh, our series of lectures on ACT and grammar preparation. We are now in lecture 3, which is going to focus primarily on, uh, on nouns. The, uh, uh, like we said in our, in our early lecture, the, uh, the thing that is always the first and in integral part of, the, uh, of a sentence in formal English. But I promised you that uh, this series of lectures would uh, uh, be something less than serious all the time, and, and I would hope maybe most of the time. So um, let me prove it to you. Let me give you an example. For example, uh, if you're watching this series of lectures because you're interested in prepping for you know, the ACT or the SAT, I'll have more to say maybe about the SAT in another, in another series of comments uh, introductory later, but the ACT, then the obvious question is, if you want to do any research, and I think you should, uh, on this test, or for example, you're working with somebody who's wanting to talk about the serious significance of this test, let's just ask the simple question, what do the letters A, C, T, stand for? I mean, I've had students that thought it just was the word ACT in all capital letters. Well, no, not quite. The research here is quite fascinating. Like, exa for example, what were the letters supposed to stand for right away? There's some interesting debate about this. Google this yourself online. You will be told that, for example, the letters stand for the American College Testing. Actually, it doesn't say the American College Testing. It just says American College Testing, A, C, T. Of course, if that's the case, then we have to ask, well, are we supposed to be testing the colleges, or are the colleges testing us American College Testing? Um, or uh, the question, American College Testing, is testing here used as a gerund? We're going to talk about gerunds here in a little bit. So just to have a bit of fun, you could maybe ask this question here in a little bit when we talk about gerunds. Or you're going to find out that ACT stands for American College Test. Right? But the obvious question here is maybe it should be T-A-C-T, the American College Test. Or is the 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 correct article. We're going to talk about those in a little bit as well, um, what we will call later a definite article. Or maybe it should be the AACT for an American college test. An is what we will later in a moment qualify as the indefinite article. And the obvious question is why it would be an American as opposed to a American. And then finally, of course, if it is ACT, as in American College Test, is it right to say the ACT, ACT test? Well, again, we're kind of here, we're just playing games, okay? And uh, now, actually, if you'll do the research on it yourself, ACT actually now doesn't stand for anything other than ACT. That is to say this test that's given to lots and lots of students, especially um, who are college-bound, right? So... Um, <clears throat> but we, we want to at least tell you and, and show you, we're, we're just having fun here playing, uh, playing around with ACT. I have consistently said to students who are about to take this test that if you approach the test with a bit of humor, a bit of fun, and you do your training appropriately, as we were using an earlier reference about going for a nice long run, you can do it. You just have to train to prepare for it. And if you do it that way, it seems to me you're going to be way more successful down the line. Why? Because everybody puts so much stress on this test that a lot of times test takers put a lot of stress on themselves. Maybe we'll have more to talk about that one as well later. We've covered in our opening comments about why we should study uh, grammar and what grammar actually means when we're using the term. Now we turn to the first part of what constitutes a sentence as we said it before. Remember we said a sentence in the formal understanding of written English is uh, something doing something. Um, and we now turn to this, uh, to this thing. But before we get into this, just one more time to remind. Um, you can ask the question, why are the rules the rules that they are? And there are actually answers for most of those, although I, I said plural answers because there are multiple answers for a lot of this stuff. But I'm really going to recommend that if all you're interested in is A, learning some basic grammar information so that B, you can get a, a, a better score on an ACT or an SAT or you know, you're, you're interested in improving your writing and your understanding of grammar and that's basically all you're interested in, then forget about the why in regards to these rules and just simply say, you know, 
really? I mean, what, what is it that I what, what is it that I got to know? And they just kind of learn it. We often will say, of course, when we do annotative reading, that there's over overarchingly two questions we always ask: the "What is it?" and "How does it work?" part. And so, for each one of these parts of speech, as we'll call as we'll qualify it, starting with nouns here, the, the first question will be, "What is it?" And then we'll obviously want to talk about how does it work. And in the case of, for example, the ACT. How does it not work? That is to say, the ACT is going to show you an example of something that's wrong, and you're going to have to be able to pick out from the, the usage passage section. You're going to have to pick out what's wrong, and then you're going to be given some options to make it right, and then obviously you kind of have to know how to make it right. Let's start really simple, okay? A thing is a noun. So it's really simple. All you got to do is ask, is it a thing? And if your answer is yeah, then it's probably a noun. The traditional definition of a noun, a person, place, or thing, as you probably were taught it in elementary school, can easily then re be, re be reduced to a thing, right? I mean, a, hello, a person is a thing, a place is a thing, and a thing is a thing, right? So that's the simple way for us to, to, to look at it. Of course, in more traditional definitions, the solid, concrete, tactile words of our language, the words that denote events, feelings, times, etc., etc., place, and on and on it goes. Right away, though, and I hope that you're flowing and taking notes over this stuff, so let's go ahead and begin to make some distinctions here in regards to the overarching understanding of what a noun is. Fundamentally, we have two kinds of nouns, okay? We have the, what we will call proper nouns, right? And here we're talking about referring to specific, you know, things, places, groups, things. These need to be capitalized. Now, we'll get into the whole thing of capitalization a little bit later in another lecture when we talk about capitalization and punctuation, but let's go ahead and just put it in our notes now that we will say when you meet what we will call a proper noun, you have to capitalize kind of one of the rules of formal uh, English grammar. Everything else is what we will call a common noun and lower case in regards to capitalization. For example, when you write the word high school, you do not capitalize it. However, if it is Warland High School, then we're talking about a very specific location, that will be capitalized, again, in formal English grammar. When we talk about nouns, and more particularly these things, right, <clears throat> one of the first questions we always want to think about is what we will call number. Now, what we mean by this simply is, are we talking about one thing versus more than one thing? Right? If we're talking about one thing, we're calling it singular, right? That is to say, warrior, right? Our school mascot, warrior, one thing. Or if we're talking about more than one thing, we're talking about plural, okay? Usually, most often, by adding either at the end of the word, the letter S, or as in warriors, or ES. As in, for example, the conclusion of the word words, right? Some nouns, and now we're going to begin to make some distinctions here, increase their number. Again, this is the term that we refer to for singular versus plural, with letter combinations other than S and ES. For example, sky, S K Y, becomes skies, S K I E S, ox becomes oxen, child becomes children, goose becomes geese. Mouse becomes meese, just a joke. Mouse becomes uh, mice. Uh, some nouns are the same in both singular and plural. And this is sometimes even difficult, um, you know, if you haven't been raised being told this. Um, I still have seniors that sometimes talk about going to the mountain and they saw a bunch of deers. Uh, but actually, of course, these are nouns that... Um, um, they're the same, both singular and plural. We don't, we don't put any kind of additional uh, understanding of end uh, letter on them. So, for example, deer, scissors, uh, moose, classic example, right? Some nouns have strange Latin endings. Some, much of our language, of course, derived from the Latin. For example, data, media, right? Technically, these are plural, but over time, they've come to be understood as singular. In our, in our language. Another classic example of the ways in which, even in formal language, in formal English, uh, the, the language has evolved over time. Okay. Uh, some nouns only come in singular form. Think about this one, right? News, garbage, happiness, information, physics, air, honesty, right? 
And you just kind of have to learn this list. And, and, and usually, of course, native speakers, they kind of, we, we intuitively kind of know this type of stuff. You hear it and you know uh, that it's right. For example, try asking this question, um, are the garbage put out? It just doesn't, right, right, right. It just doesn't sound right. You know, we, we know it's is the garbage put out, right? No matter if we're talking about a whole bunch of garbage versus a small singular amount, right? Collective nouns, uh, we should point out, stand for groups, quantities, masses of things. But we will treat them, this is key for your notes, as singular, as one. So it's not the family are, but the family is. Not the class are, but the class is. Jury. Team, not we don't say team are, but team is, right? The team is going to win, not the team are going to win, right? But, this is one of those exceptions, we'll have a number of these as we talk, but when you refer to individuals within the group, the team, right, the collective, they, they can be understood as plurals. For example, the team were divided in their feelings about the loss suggests that members of the team Different members were divided. But to be honest, this is really more a convention of British English than it is American English, and so you can do more of your own research on this. And I would say about any of the topics we're talking about, that if you Google any of this and you go on to do any of your own research, you're going to get all kinds of online help. Obviously, at YouTube, you're going to get all kinds of help to maybe even kind of flesh this out for you even better. For example, if I'm not doing a good enough job for you to understand this, if you want to learn more, lots of places to go get that information. Nouns can indicate possession, right? For example, Steve's face, day's end, right? This is an interesting one. And this is one that oftentimes students have heard it, but they, didn't, they can't remember it. So here we go. We're going to put a star next to this one in our notes. Nouns can pretend, like I say, I, I like to say it this way. Nouns can pretend to be verbs. That is to say they kind of start to look like verbs. Or sometimes what we'll call past participles, we'll get into that in a little bit later, right? We call these words gerunds, G-E-R-U-N-D-S, gerunds. That's how you say the word, okay? And they are verbs ending with I-N-G, okay? For example, to text is a verb, it's an action, it's doing something. But if you were to say, I love texting, now all of a sudden you're talking about a verb with an I-N-G, texting becomes here a noun, it's a thing, texting. It's a thing. It's an action, right? That is a gerund. That's all, that, that's all really we're talking about when we talk about these gerunds, right? Of course, just to have a bit of fun, back to our original question, the first use of ACT was American college testing. Is testing here used as a gerund? It's a fun question. I mean, you can do your own research, or you can ask somebody that's really serious about this and let them kind of figure it out for you and with you. Some nouns can play other parts of speech. Watch this game. This is always fun in the English language. For example, the word love. Love is awesome. Love is a noun. It's a thing. I love you. I really do. Love is a verb. Write me a love song. Well, we know that song is a thing and therefore a noun, but what kind of song? A love song. Love is an adjective. So these Nouns can use, can, can uh, be involved in different uses, right? So we've got to pay attention to this, obviously, as uh, context will provide for us. And you're going to hear us say this a lot, especially as we get into this prep of the ACT. Context is a, a, a big part of it, which means that while you're reading, you're taking into not just individual words, but the context of what you're reading, which is, of course, what makes reading on the ACT so problematic for a lot of our students, right? Why? We don't read a lot anyway, and then we don't read under time conditions with stress associated with it, and so it becomes kind of problematic for us sometimes to understand immediately what context is going down. Well, more to say about this, obviously. There is this interesting thing called the article. No, I'm not talking about something that's been written and you read it. I'm talking about in, in English grammar. We call these things articles. Now, you... Here's a classic example of how you know grammar without knowing grammar. I mean, you know how it works often without even knowing that's what it's called. The article is simply the three words, the, a, or an. Okay. If you don't know if something's a noun, all you got to do is put one of these words in front of it. It pretty much works to tell you if it's a noun, right? The car, for example, or whatever. 
By the way, just so you know this, some people have actually called the article another part of speech, making it not eight, but now nine. So, wow, an interjection along with a, an, or the now becomes uh, a, a part of speech. Of course, as we have said, this is all in the end kind of really silly to debate. It really doesn't matter. We're far more interested in how these things work. Again, not so much debating about whether it's a legitimate part of speech. There's two kinds of articles for your notes, and I would... I would maybe, just so in the future, if somebody like says something to you, at least have a sense of what we're talking about. It's, it's totally intuitive and it makes sense once we say it. Two kinds of articles. There's indefinite articles. This is the A or the N, right? A team, an enemy, means, think about it, it's kind of indefinite. Any team, any enemy, right? By the way, A gets used in front of consonant sounds, a car, an gets used in front of vowel sounds, an apple, right? And then you have the definite article, the, right? The team, a specific team, definite, right? The enemy, right? This means a, again, particular team, particular enemy, okay? By the way, just as a side note, because I like to kind of point this, type, this kind of stuff out to you guys, uh, some researchers of all of this have pointed out that the use of the article explains the difference between learning a language and acquiring a language, right? So, for example, you can learn a, a, a language and you can kind of know it, but to acquire the language means that you can fine-tune, you can hear, hear the language, right? Um, ELL uh, learners often struggle with hearing the distinction, for example, between A and AN, right? Um, here's a fun one. You can look this one up, you can Google this one. What about the word history? Which one of the two indefinite articles is it? A history or an history? And by the way, if you Google this, you will see that this is one more of those British English kinds of um, high fluting types of examples of how British English will make distinctions. Part of it is because they do not pronounce the word, the, the letter H. And when you drop the letter H, then the next sound is, of course, a vowel sound I. So it's, uh, you know, so it, 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 it can sound a little bit foreign. If you hear somebody say an history, um, uh, it's usually because the H is dropped, so it's an history. Okay. Uh, let's make a quick comment um, that's often thrown in here along with this idea of the nouns, and that is this thing about interjections. I mean, obviously, it's not really a part of speech, right? Wow is not obviously a part of speech. But um, these are words, uh, interestingly enough, we use them quite regularly. I mean, think about this. We use interjections a lot when we're really happy. Wow. Or <laughs> when we're really upset. We can think of any number of profane words that uh, immediately come to mind that you'd probably put an exclamation mark uh, right after, right? We, we want to say this, though, and this is important, so write this down. We want to stay away from using these interjections almost always in formal writing. We stay away from the use of the exclamation mark as well. Well, it, it, uh, it's not a good idea to do that in our writing. I mean, if you want to write for emphasis in formal writing, probably not a good idea to do this very often. You will have instructors that will often say, stay away from it entirely. Well, there you go. I told you we were going to be very simple, and there it is. An introduction to, uh, you know, to the nouns, uh, the things that we've been talking about. But sometimes we want to talk about very particular things, that is to say nouns, but we don't actually want to name specifically that thing or that noun. That's when we use pronouns, okay? Now, why do they call it pronouns? Well, there's a lot of different mnemonics here that can be played. I think the easiest one is to say that a pronoun is a thing or noun that has some kind of addition uh, to, to the meaning for us, specific but not wanting to actually say the very thing itself. When we come back to lecture, uh, uh, to lecture four here in a bit, we'll obviously play that game, right, on pronouns. Thank you very much. I appreciate your kind attention.